Hi, I'm Jim Zogby, and welcome to Viewpoint. Tonight, we're going to talk to Michael Kaiser. He's president of the Kennedy Center about his groundbreaking Arab arts initiative. Then we'll discuss the upcoming elections in France, and now recently the announced uh, upcoming elections in Turkey, and their implications on the Middle East and foreign policy in general. But first, I'm pleased to welcome to the show Azar Nafisi. She's the visiting fellow and lecturer at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, where she teaches on the relationship between culture and politics. Dr. Nafisi has written and lectured extensively on the political implications of literature and culture, and is the author of the best-selling book, Reading Lolita in Tehran. Uh, pleased to have you here with us tonight. It's Thank you so to be much. Here. Thank um, you. I read the book and I want to talk about it in a bit, but first I want to just put up two quotes from articles that you've written recently. Um, first is a quote uh, from the Los Angeles Times As someone who has for years advocated the best policy toward Iran is to support the Iranian people's democratic aspirations and that the only means of establishing pluralism and openness in that country is through democratic and nonviolent means. And then a following quote uh, from uh, an article in the New Republic. At the same time, the notion that Iran will be subdued into compliance with a handful of precision-guided missiles is as dangerous and fanciful as the belief that an invaded Iraq would serve as a model for enlightened democracy. Indeed, to attack Iran at this point would be to send a lifeline to the regime's most militaristic elements, which would use an attack as an excuse to quash all domestic dissent. Well, uh, watching the current political debate here, it's between two poles, but not those two poles. No. The one pole is bomb, invade, or do something, and the other pole is engage, yes. but far short of the, uh, the, the reaching out to progressive and or um, more moderate elements in the country who want to create change from within. Uh, size up for me the, 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 the course we're on and the, the, the discourse as you see it here. Well, both views you mentioned I think are very simplistic and they're sort of the other side of the coin to one another. First of all, they take, um, they, they take the political um, life in Iran out of its context. They reduce it to only its elite and, and to fight between two divisions within the elite. And they don't take into consideration 70 million people and their interactions and actions in relationship with the Islamic regime and how that is reflected in the actions and reactions of the elite. Uh, so I think when you talk about engagement, you need to, I mean, for me, the other option is completely out. So I'm not going to be spending time saying why we should not attack Iran. You know, I, I, I think that um, you cannot answer violence with violence, and they're far better in us uh, in terms of, um, you know, attacks. And um, this will be just terrible for the Iranian people. But if you engage, you need to have a context. And, and you need to understand that Iran has a dynamic civil society and we need to support and give voice to the voices and at the same time um, be able to negotiate with the Islamic regime um, based on our principles. Um, we're forgetting our own principles uh, and so engagement turns into appeasement and the military attack becomes the only one solution. Of the, one of the big concerns I hear about the engagement approach um, from Arab leaders mm -hmm. is that Iran has become so emboldened yeah. and empowered yes. by the situation in Iraq uh, and by the situation right. between Israel and Lebanon and the, yeah. the, the way Hezbollah stood up to Israel, uh, if you will, that uh, engagement now emboldens further and, and presents Ahmadinejad with a, with a victory. What would you say to that? Well, it depends upon how you engage. If, if you um, negotiate with Iran in order to appease Ahmadinejad or in order to reward him uh, for what he's doing uh, in, um, in Iraq and in the rest of the region or, or to say that you are bribable, then I think it is wrong. If you know the context uh, and stand firm on your conditions so that if they don't accept, you'll isolate Iran. I think it should be understood that U.S. uses all the means for engagement based on principles and then no one can um, argue with you if they do not respond properly. Next week on the show, um, I will air an interview that I pre-taped last week with uh, Mohammad Reza Khatami. He was 
uh, former deputy yes. speaker of the parliament in Iran and uh, brother of the president uh, and son-in-law of Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, he was uh, presented uh, in the discussions that we had there as a leading reformer. Mm -hmm. Describe, if you will, just set the context for listeners who may tune in next week. What kind of reformer, how much reform, what, what does reform mean in the context of, uh, of Iran today led by someone like uh, Mohammad Reza Khatami? Uh, well, uh, partly, of course, um, when we talk about Mohammad Reza Khatami, we should talk about him in the light of what happened during President Khatami's, his brother's um, uh, presidency. I think um, the fact that a faction that was very and still is very ro loyal to the Islamic regime and the revolution um, starts having serious questions and, 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 and understands that the situation cannot be um, resolved resolved without some fundamental changes um, is very good and, 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 and it should be always welcomed. On the other hand, um, uh, people whom Mohammad Reza Khatami represents uh, were in power for eight years and a lot of terrible things happened during those eight years for which we are now paying. Mm -hmm. And I just do not think that he can go ahead without uh, being accountable. Uh, and being accountable is not blaming people. Uh, you need to let people know what happened. What happened to the movement that you were leading, uh, which, which led to, to Mr. Ahmadinejad? And, and, and it led to so much disillusion uh, within different strata of Iranian people who supported you. In order for us to understand then where he's going from here, I think without a self-critical outlook and without understanding what we did in the past, we cannot move towards the future. And, and this is the problem that I have. One answer that he gave me that disturbed me a, a great deal was uh, I had seen you on the BBC just the day before talking about what was happening to young women yes. uh, this yes. spring again in okay. Iran. And right now, actually. Uh, being taken in for showing hair yes. or eye makeup, etc. Uh, and now moving toward men for certain kinds of haircuts, etc. Um, I asked him about it. Um, and he sort of dismissed it with a boys will be boys. This happens every spring and then it's forgotten and then things ease up and then uh, and then it goes goes back to normal, but then the next spring it starts again. I, is it a boys will be boys, or well, is there something more dangerous? Well, this here? is like saying when you when you question um, uh, people in power in Iran about um, the punishment of stoning for to death for adultery and prostitution, they say, oh, we have a moratorium on it. You know, we're talking about principles. We're not talking about boys will be boys. We're talking about the fact that the idea of um, clothing, that no state or no authority has a right to tell the citizens how to relate to their God. And, and for women, whether to veil or unveil, it is a deep question of faith and a question of choice. And if a leading politician thinks that the issue of choice and individual rights is merely boys will be boys, um, then that is rather disturbing. You know, and especially in the light of the fact that uh, Iranian women, whether they are um, traditionally Muslim, secular, modern Muslim, they are pro they're having problems in regards to their fundamental rights. It is not the issue of girls and boys, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, and that is the problem that we have uh, with, with the reformists. And, wanna, and they need to address it. I want to take you back to the, the revolution itself. Mm -hmm. um, I belonged at the time, uh, it was in my first year of graduate school, and uh, there was a group of the Committee for Artistic and Intellectual Freedom in Iran. Mm 